we were get, I mean, literally getting threatened to be fired every week when we would come back. Who what? The Vince. The Rock leaves the nation. I become Triple H, leave DX. We battle over the WWE Championship. Like our careers sort of, in a way, marry each other and are intertwined with each other. Taker's ear was like hanging. We had a plastic surgeon gonna meet him in the States. And I stood for the longest time on a seat behind him, putting pressure wow. on his head and his oh, ear. Cause wow. once you get up at pressure, right, yeah, yeah, you yeah. bleed like a stuck yeah. pig. Randy Orton and Dave Batista. And then we put them with us. And the whole goal of that group was to get them both to be mega stars. We've got Logan Paul, who you guys have signed up, right? Yeah. How do you feel about that? You don't do what he's done at WrestleMania without a lot of hard work and a lot of effort. Welcome to Sport Bible Stories. Today, joining us is one of the greatest WWE legends of all time. It is the one, the only. It's Triple H. I am honoured yeah. to yeah. see you. Yeah. No, no. I have to say, that was very professional. Because like meeting you beforehand, I thought, wow, this is going to be very unprofessional. Yes. And then <laughs> you were actually like, you delivered that like you were a pro. See, I can, a little, just want the yeah. producer Wake to up. note that. Did you hear that? That's an icon's validation. Yeah. Thank you, if that could be noted. Cheers, cheers, um, I do guys. appreciate it. Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, you know? I can phrase it that way though. I can definitely let's, like let's pretend at least that it's that yeah. way. I'm um, delighted to have yeah, you man. here. How are you finding it's London? Nice to be Welcome. Here. It's great. Great. I've been, you know, I've been coming here for 30 years. You, you He's know, a West Ham fan. What's, yeah. What do you mean? How's he like London? He's yeah. West are you, are you trying? Are you going to try and bond over that? The fact that you're both sort of West Ham fans. This is, you're going to use this. We don't need to try it when, when you're a hammer. Yeah. You're going to use this natural, as, as you know? bonding. It's all, it's all good. Yeah. Leave me out. You know, like I've been coming here for 30 years. So to me, this is. It's funny people make such a big deal sometimes about traveling over mm -hmm. to the UK or something like that. So it's like going to LA. It's, it's true. Yeah. You know, you just crazy. You know, hop on a plane, come here. I love it here. Um, you know, been coming here for years, been a part of this culture here. Our, our fan base is so big here. It's awesome. Yeah. And you're in the UK for Clash at the Castle this Saturday in Cardiff. Cardiff, yeah. How's that all shaping up? It's amazing. Uh, you know, first of all, it's the first large scale, like premium live event or pay per view mm. that we've uh, done here in 30 years. So, um, you know, and we're here all the time. We tour here a lot, but this is the first time for us coming back here with a stadium show yeah. in a massive way like this um, in 30 years. So uh, it's going to be crazy. Uh, you know, I can't wait to get to Cardiff. Everybody's been telling us yes. this. The whole city has taken over. Yeah. Like you can't walk two feet without seeing something about the show mm -hmm. or hearing people talk about it. Uh, we'll probably have the 60,000 plus Sold out, in yeah. that stadium. Yeah, it's packed. You can't get a... The hotel room and they're passionate as well. The Welsh, but, I mean, you yeah. can get a hotel room. I heard you talk about it earlier. Well, I, I, I've <laughs> got a friend in a really high place. Yeah. Was, that, was a, that was an amazing moment beforehand. Obviously, we were having a having a conversation off uh, off uh, screen, and you were in the room, and Steve was acting like he could hook me up with a ticket. <laughs> like, like, mate, delusions of grandeur. Who do you, who do you think you are? Oh, if anyone needs anything WWE related, he's the man to talk to yeah. in this room. He's got um, the hooker. <laughs> I'm getting some stuff from him later. <laughs> <laughs> Should we start with some quick fire? Let's go for the quick fire. Quick fire. Um, first of all, yes. pretty simple one. I don't even know why we're starting with it, to be honest with you, but. <laughs> you get the cup. What is your name? <laughs> Triple H. There you go. Where are you from, Triple H? Yeah, so are we talking reality-based or character-wise? Because reality-based, I live in Greenwich, Connecticut. Character-wise, I live in Greenwich, Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on which one you want. Yeah. What's your occupation? Mm. Mm, that's a tough one. Um, I do a little bit of everything for WWE. You know, it, it, if you want the exact title, I'm the uh, chief content officer for WWE. I, I oversee everything that has to do with uh, creative of everything we do from top to bottom. Um, run our talent, run our talent development, our recruiting process, uh, the, the sort of the life cycle of the talent from the moment we identify them in college or wherever they're gonna start from, all the way through to the end of their careers, to the Hall of Fame, to beyond. From you know, college, legend, I everything. never knew that that's how early these guys, this, in, in, in the UK, well, in the UK, in football, that's, that's my yeah. sport, this, and, and same as NFL and anything really, scouting. Yeah. Um, I didn't know, you, you, where, where do you go to scout? Well, so it, it's, you know, the, it's a different environment than, mm. than what you have here, like UK for, for football. You guys are, um, in some manner, you're finding kids that have a skill set for the game, right? And then sort of paying them 
in essence, to join a club mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. affiliated with a, a, a Premier League, a Premier League. Yeah, yeah. And, and and sort of following that up the line. And so you've worked with these guys since, you know, very, some very- 12, some eight. I yeah, was going to yeah, say yeah. eight years old, mm-hmm. whatever, and, and worked with them along the way. A little bit different for us. Um, it's funny, we do have some talent that started that came from the UK that have said to me over the years, like, I never understood why you guys start wrestling so late in the States. And I was like, because we have labor laws okay. that says <laughs> that says you can't work and be paid as a kid uh, for somebody. So, um, yeah. we, but, don't, we don't adopt that. No, yeah, yeah. You guys, <laughs> we just start yeah. work. No, like, yeah, 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 start earning your kid. I've got a three year old. I feel like she should start pulling her weight. Crack that whip early. <laughs> right? hey, you get to it. Yeah. But, um, for us in in the U.S., it it really now stems from college. Are you familiar with what NIL is? No. So in in, in collegiate athletics, prior to recently, um, NCAA rules, you cannot be paid yes, for anything. Yeah. So if if we were talking, um, I'll give you the example of this. Gable Stevenson. Do you know who that is? No. So G- Gable was a uh, um, just. In, in May, just graduated from college, two-time NCAA champion for wrestling, um, and then went to the Olympics for the United States, won a gold medal um, in Olympic in the Olympics for wrestling, um, is signed with us now. I've known Gable probably since he was a sophomore in college, I think. Um, we had to be extremely careful with things like even if we wanted to give him tickets for he and his yes, family to come to yes. a show because that would be against NCAA rules. He could be disqualified from collegiate athletics mm. for sort of being paid in some manner. Okay. Even, really though, even, well. even though we're an entertainment company. Yeah. Very, very, very tough. So it's always tough for us. So collegiate athletics were out for us. We had to recruit in a much different way. Um you come in uh, a year and two years ago, uh, they changed the rules for what's called NIL, name, image, likeness, that college athletes can use their name and image and likeness to create a business for themselves, so to speak. So they can be paid for those things. They can do endorsements. They can do all these other things. It opened up a world for us. We don't see it as, you know, paying somebody a small amount of money to say, hey, I watch WWE and Mm -hmm. isn't that great. Um, for us, it's a, a recruiting tool. For us, it's um, long-term recruiting. So we look at collegiate athletes in almost any sport, um, and we try to work with them on what WWE is, what we are as an entertainment property, but what we are also behind the scenes. Some of those we'll offer deals to under the NIL program where we'll pay them a sum of money. They will be WWE athletes. We help them build their brand. We help them uh, with media training. We help them with life skills of like finances and and anything that WWE does that they they can have access to. They can come to our performance center. They can do all those things. Meanwhile, they're out there for us um, sort of talking about WWE to every sporting event they go to, athletes around the country, they're talking about, you know, WWE. And for most of them, when they graduate from college, WWE is the opportunity that they are looking mm-hmm. at to become a WWE superstar. For ones that don't, that promotion the entire time is phenomenal for yeah, us. Right? Say, they talk they, about what we do, all of it, and, it, and it benefits them greatly. They come out way better than they went in. Um, for those that are a part of that program, though, when they leave college athletics, so if they're just a shade too small or whatever that is for the NFL or not fast enough or anything like that. Or, you know, I use this example all the time. They might be a a college hammer thrower. There's not a lot of calling for hammer throwers once you graduate college, right? It's either try to go to the Olympics or get a job coaching or figure out your career from there. This is a way for them to stay high level athletics Mm. long in their, you know, into their careers and all of that. So, um, it's a pathway to WWE that didn't exist before. That's and it's incredible. opened up it's, floodgate for us yeah, of, of people now coming to us, rushing towards us, looking for that opportunity. Whereas before, we kind of had to go select and find them and yeah. say, hey, have you ever thought about becoming a WWE superstar? So difficult. Was there, was there a moment for you when you were young? Like, was there a maybe that, that sort of wrestler that you mm. fell in love with that made you love the sport? Was there an iconic? So I, I fell in love with the business and I, I tell this story a lot. So when I was like five or six years old, I remember sitting in a in a in our living room with my dad and I had a 
football helmet on, American football helmet on, little plastic football, was playing, whatever, and my dad turned on wrestling, and how long ago it was, he went over and turned the channel yeah, yeah, yeah. on the TV, put wrestling on, it was Chief J Strongbow, and I remember sitting down on his lap and just being fascinated by it. Like, and to me, it was the greatest thing after that I was hooked. For me, growing up, Ric Flair was sort of the man and the yeah. be all end all of, of, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and a bit tame that one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to this day, <laughs> and, um, but sort of that was my impetus for it and, and kind of it was what I grew up wanting to do but had no idea how to get into it. I started training at 14 in the gym because I wanted to be a, a WWE superstar and I wanted to get big enough to be a WWE superstar. Still having no idea how to get there and then through a bunch of unique circumstances as I would get in my early 20s, I would find somebody that would turn me on to a name that would help me, you know, uh, through much... Uh, bugging. I didn't <laughs> yes, want to give me the name, that. but I eventually yeah. got it and, you know, was lucky enough to to get into it, find somebody to train me, be good at it and end up with a career that so I have. you've solved that problem. The problem that you face, you've helped to solve because That's, now at least there is a pathway. It is exactly what I was setting out to try to do was create that mm-hmm. pathway. And now we're in the process of, for the last 10 years or so, we've created that recruiting, you know, effort, also started a brand called NXT. Yeah, man. NXT. Like an academy. Yeah, NXT mm. for us is is that academy model or that sort of collegiate athletics for us. So if Raw and SmackDown are the NFL for football, for American football, NXT is collegiate athletics. And we had a, a small brand here called NXT UK. Um, we were headed down this road prior to the pandemic. Pandemic kind of like put a halt on it, but we've just shut that brand down because we're going to relaunch it in 23 as okay. NXT Europe and try to blow it out bigger. Is there but, an age limit? Yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll no, check it out. There's a muscle limit, though. You'd be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm in a bath towel today, boss. <laughs> yeah. so it is a nice towel. <laughs> it's very in, apparently. We spill it's our in, water. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a gift that keeps giving. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Stay in that. Yeah. <laughs> what the best part is you just wring it out, put it right back in. Exactly. Yeah. No one need no. Yeah. Um, you know, the, in, the intent will be to take NXT Europe and, and bring that around the world. So NXT Europe, and I'll, I'll, I'll just throw names out, NXT Australia, NXT mm-hmm. South Africa, right. um, South America, Mexico, right? Like all those Incredible. things and eventually build that into a global system that will uh, lead to almost a World Cup scenario. So Crazy. the World Cup Crazy. finals for NXT will one year be in London, the next year maybe Mexico City, the year after that be in- Sick idea, I'm sorry, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable idea, you gotta man. Think, you got to think big. Yeah. And, and all the while, really, what you're doing is you're building this, you're, you're building a fan base for college football while you're building stars for the major leagues, which is Raw, SmackDown, mm. WrestleMania, right? And those markets feed up. And while, like in India right now, we are the second biggest sport in India outside of cricket, cricket. which is like a religion, yeah. Thing, yeah. right? So... It's massive already, but imagine that scale when we have a brand on the ground of native Indian yeah, people mm. having their own brand. And then one of them, I'm just saying just yeah. one, mm-hmm. uh, branches out from there, goes to Raw, goes to SmackDown, headlines WrestleMania. It's game changing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You mentioned um, Ric Flair. I wanted to ask a question there and I was interested in to... Well, ask me when I can tell about him. Um, <laughs> but it's more of... If you had a Mount Rushmore, we call it, we, we always say, who would you pick in your five-a-side team of, of the legends? If you had a Mount Rushmore of legends. It, so it's hard for me to say because, you know, I feel like when people give, because that's a, a, a such a frequently asked question, like, well, who's on your route, Mount Rushmore? Depends on how you look at it. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you go back uh, 40, 50 years ago, right, there's names like Bruno San Martino, Buddy Rogers, that without those people... Yeah. The Hulk Hogan's, the Randy Savages, the Ricky mm. Steamboats, the Rick the Flair, Ric Flairs, yeah. they, they don't exist, Crazy. Mm. right? And then if you go past that into, you know, this next generation of stars, which you could argue are, are bigger than anything that there's ever been of the Rocks and the Austins and the Undertakers, Shawn Michaels, right? Like those level of people, um, that's a whole different level of conversation, but to say you can only put four people of all it's those, mm. it's it's sort of kind of unfair. And then when you get to even that point, you say like, okay, well, how do you say a Mount Rushmore of this industry without putting Vince on it? Because without Vince, yeah, 
taking what was a regional promotion and stuff that was happening for the most part. You know, people will go back to the the 30s and the 40s and say, well, wrestling was happening in in giant arenas and stadiums. Then it was totally different, right? Then it went through this period of time where it was in like bars and, mm. you know, very, mm. very small. Um, you know, taking it out of that and turning it into a global sensation, right, where there's this one brand and, and we can go any place in the world and put 60,000 people into a stadium um, and sell it out and, and have p- millions of people watching around the world. It's a different conversation. How, how could you have that conversation without putting him mm-hmm. yeah. on that Mount Rushmore as well? You know, it's your and, Mount Rushmore. Though. And, he and I didn't even it. I didn't even mention like Andre the Giant, Jeez. who like when you talk about that, you talk about somebody that's almost mythical yeah. qualities of who he was, mm-hmm. a real human being, mm-hmm. Andre the Giant, but then almost like mythical quality of like maybe one of the first sort of like global. Superstars, yeah. like everybody on this planet knew who Andre the yeah. Giant was, in, mm. especially in that moment in time. So it's really hard to pick it's a, a tough one, isn't yeah. it? When you first started out, did you have some explicit goals that you were hoping to achieve? Did you have something in mind that you were hoping to achieve? It's a funny thing. Like, I started out wanting to be really good at this. So my goal was to be a really good, well rounded, polished performer. In my mind, as a naive kid, I thought, man, if I could do that and get pretty good at it to make enough money that I could retire at like 35 or something um, (laughs) and go live my life, right? Like have some other businesses, you know, then then you're not too old to start a family. I I knew this would be a rough business to to Mm -hmm. have a family and kids. And, you know, it doesn't really at that time, you're on the road a couple hundred days a year, it really didn't didn't connect you know it wasn't as glamorous back then was it not really but yeah yeah but but it's it's a changed business now people ask me all the time about the business today versus back then i have three daughters 16 14 12 right same but not the same age okay 17 15 and five which it's the best right like and and, (laughs) do you know i've got one and i'm having a vasectomy yeah Yeah. Yeah. i'm like really and i'm really looking for i'm really looking forward to the vasectomy i like when i go to sleep at night it's something that i really like sort of fantasize over yeah. I cannot wait to have a vasectomy <laughs> I don't know how anyone all due respect to both of you I think you're both insane for having more than one child yeah but I when when we talk about the our industry there's a, you know if you would ask me 25 years ago you know hey you're gonna have three daughters how, how would you feel about them getting in this business I would have said hell no mm-hmm. like not a chance I would ever let them anywhere near it today I would say absolutely if one of them wanted to try yeah. to, to in what role though so this, just as a wrestler, whatever role they okay. wanted to, you know, mm-hmm. to me, um, I, I, my, my middle daughter is, is looking to play American football, and I've, I, I sit on a, a, a board for concussion, right? So I understand the dangers, mm-hmm. and um, I had said to my wife, if we had a boy, I would never let him play football. I have a girl, and she and wants you. to play football, American football. She's the only girl on her team, and I said yes, and my wife was like, but "How do you let her do it, but you wouldn't let a boy do it?" And I said, "Because I don't want to tell her no as a girl." Mm, I yeah. don't want her to feel like, well, I'm a girl, so I can't do that. Yeah. She can try to do anything she wants to do. I'm there to tell her the dangers. I'm there to, but there to support her if she wants to do it. And I'm hoping girls are way smarter than boys. Yeah, great. So I'm hoping that she's smart enough to get hit a few times and go like, oh, yeah, you know, what? Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something different than this. Like this <laughs> is not for me. Do you think being a girl dad has changed you as a man? I think so. Yeah, same. Look, I think if you go through life and you don't change, if you're the same person you were five years ago, you wasted five years. You guys, and we'll get into the Attitude Era. Yeah. You, Shawn Michaels, and you look wild. Like, go to sleep. Fuck it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I remember seeing an interview with yourself where when you had started the DX again, by then now you'd had a, you was a dad, and it's like you can, you, certain things you've done back then, it was. It would be difficult to do as a as a dad, as a mature man. How do you yeah. feel about that sort of change? Well, at, at that point in time, too, Sean had gone from born being again Christian, a full yeah. degenerate to a born again yeah. Christian, yeah, yeah, yeah. and there were moments in time where we would do things, like we'd make suggestions to do things on TV, and Sean would be like, "Oof, I can't, guys, I can't <laughs> so you be a part of that." I'd be like, "Well, just you cover your eyes, so you have yeah. plausible <laughs> deniability, and I'll do it." And we would turn it into a joke mm-hmm. that it was, you know, it was funny that he. Couldn't be a part of that anymore. Yeah, look, I look back on some of those things and I think to myself, man, I, I don't know how I would feel about that today, but same point in time, 
I don't know, I have this belief that uh, parents are there to be the parents, mm -hmm. not TV, not celebrities, yeah. not all yeah. those things. There are going to be good, good and bad examples of everything in life all around you. And then it is parents' jobs yeah. to teach kids mm -hmm. or, or, or parents or guardians or whoever that they look up to, hopefully, that they have in their life to say, no, that's... Yeah. That's not. Yeah, yeah, that, that's not real. That's not reality. That's not what you want to do. My kids. It's funny. People sometimes talk about what we do and the perception of violence. Um, my kids have been watching this since they were born. Mm -hmm. Right. My yeah. my first daughter was on the road with us every day. She traveled on a bus with us and would come to every show. When she got old enough to talk, you know, I I explained to her every day what it was. She would say, uh, she would say to me before the matches, like we. we'd get to a show and she'd come in the arena she'd say who's going to push you down today dad <laughs> you know <laughs> so no she, one nobody yeah, yeah, she, she would look at it yeah. who's going to push you down right and yeah. then she'd be backstage playing patty cake with big show yeah. you know this big Mad. seven foot <laughs> 500 pound guy and then i would say all right mr Beam, mr big show gonna go play now and she would come <laughs> out and sit in the crowd and watch us go perform and you know she, but that. she inherently yeah. understood it and not we taught them it's entertainment. Yeah, From the yeah. whole way, it's entertainment. It's amazing. This, you, yeah. You've been in the industry for three decades now. Yeah. Hard to believe. To, that, that's an achievement in itself. I mean, that's outrageous, really, when you think about when you think about the arduous nature of the industry to be mm. to be ever present for three decades. Unreal. Is there a moment, or is there one thing that you're particularly proud of? If if it were to boil down to sort of one thing, is there anything mm. that stands out? It's so hard. Like. There's different meanings to different things, right? So some people today will joke because I have, uh, from a recruiting and a developmental standpoint through NXT, um, I'm, I'm sort of nurturing these kids' mm -hmm. careers in a way from the very get-go. So people will jokingly call me Papa H, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it, it truly is, like, there's things that you're proud of in your career, things I'm proud of in my career that I love that that you know, were so meaningful to me and I had worked so hard to get to and all that stuff and, and was so meaningful. But then there's moments in time that really can only be associated to like saying, um, you've accomplished things in your life and you're very proud of them. Mm -hmm. But if you watch your kids accomplish something, that level of pride it's that nice. you have yeah, is totally different yeah. and at a totally different level. So for some re way for me, watching somebody that you know Alton, randy Orton, maybe or yeah, yeah or, or you know a charlotte flair who came to mm -hmm. me one day and said i think i want to i want to try this and i'm like charlotte you've been around it your whole life but you have had never had an interest why today and you know we started from nxt didn't she yeah homegrown yeah, she'd man. never stepped through the ropes before you know until yeah, yeah. she got to us and it's kind of hard to song. believe given her family but yeah. But then to see where she is now, the level of stardom that she has, the level of success she's had, how good she is at this. You know, it's hard not to look at her. It's, it's Rick's daughter, but in some way it's hard not to look mm -hmm. at her like one of your own kids and feel that level of pride for her. So, you know, to say one thing, it's tough. Just to me, I just, I love this business. I want to see it uh, continue into the future. So in the opportunity that I have now, um, it's it's to run that creative and take it into the future, and that's a massive responsibility. But I'm humbled by it, and and really uh, want nothing more than to see it succeed because it's 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 everything I ever wanted to do. So to see somebody else that has that mm. same passion get that opportunity, it's there's nothing like. Especially it. as you say, you didn't or it wasn't that it wasn't available to get that sort of help at the time. Yeah, and, um, the fact that you can. As I say, nurture these. It must. It's a different. I don't know. Do they call it in, in, intrinsic reward? Where it's like you're not getting paid. But it's just a yeah. feeling. Well, don't get it wrong. I get paid. Yeah. Well, too. Yeah. 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 No, but but like, yeah. there is a point to that. Look, there's there's a moment just when we're recruiting kids, <laughs> where we're working with these high school, uh, uh, college athletes, and you know, their dream. Right, is to continue to be a professional athlete. Their dream is to get in WWE, and they go through this grueling three-day tryout, and there's this moment where we sit down with them at a table, and we're offering people contracts to come start training with us in Florida, in Orlando, Florida, to see if they can become a WWE superstar. There's always stories to these kids, and sometimes you hear these stories where, like, this kid grew up in a one-room mm. shack with 10 kids with... This has had this 
you know, incredible journey, got a scholarship, was, you know, but eked it out through college, has been starving, done all this thing, and you say, I want you to come to Orlando, Florida, start to train to become a WWE superstar, and they break down yeah, and yeah, and, and lose it, and it's... It's just well, impacting after, people's lives, yeah, aren't you? You're changing, you're changing people's trajectory, their yeah. natural trajectory. You're you're improving them and giving people an opportunity. It's, it's crazy because I know what it was like when I got that call. Yeah, and I didn't go through a tenth of that. Mm. You know, like that hardship and that level of of um, you know difficulty mm -hmm. in their life to get to where they are and to have this opportunity that if this pans out, this. So it, it's it's not just like wow this changes my life. No, this changes your life, your kids' yeah, life, your their kids' life. Yeah. This is generational yeah. change for you. Yeah. Um, you know, th and there's a lot of that for us. We we have a, a particular person that I can think of that came out of the military and just grew up in poverty. Went to the military. We found them in the military. They when they got out of the military. They came to train for us and is now performing for us on a regular basis. And when I say like, like just fully altered every mm -hmm. person in wow. every person in their life, it fully altered their life. Yeah, nobody would associate it. I think when people think about the industry, I don't necessarily they think that they think about what it gives back. Right. I think creating opportunity for people and giving people a pathway into a different life, it's it's holistic as much as it is entertainment, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it really is. And then to see the joy that they get out of then, you know, uh, giving back, mm -hmm. you know, uh, such a big part of being a WWE superstar is is giving back in the community and stuff. So whether that's Make-A-Wish, whether that's, um, you know, supporting causes, you know, pediatric cancer, whatever that is, their ability to give back, to, yeah. you know, when, when you get to a place in your life where you're, a sick child's wish. Yeah. There, there's, there's nothing. There's nothing like all the money, all the fame, all the other stuff is that big compared to that moment. You yeah. Know? What? Why do you think wrestling has such a? Even if we make it more specific to you, why do you think DX was so incredibly popular? I think in the moment we captured a time. It's, it's like the, at that period of time, Stone Cold Steve Austin, right? He connected with people. There was. Vince represented corporate greed and sort of that 80s, early 90s, like yeah. corporate boss. Huh. Yeah. Oh, that big foam briefcase. Yeah. 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 Stone, Stone, yeah. Stone Cold, yeah. Stone Cold yeah. Steve Austin was the everyman. Mm. Drank beer, right? Like, I think so many people in the world at that point in time wanted to, you know, who didn't want to go out? Stun their boss, yeah, yeah. drink beer over his <laughs> yeah, yeah, drink yeah, beer yeah. over his lifeless body, <laughs> flip him off, run around, make millions of dollars, and be the man. Right? Like it, it, it was perfect in that time frame. We were anti-authority on on every level mm -hmm. of of coming out of the sort of the the proper seventies and eighties, and even like this like cartoony eighties world of all of a sudden real edgy mm -hmm. like. Look, that's who we were. We weren't doing, we weren't going like, what would resonate with people today? Mm -hmm. We were just going out Went there, there. Yeah. and entertaining ourselves in mm -hmm. some way, doing what we thought was funny or whatever was driving us to do. We were just being ourselves really amplified, but it connected. We were, I think, in some manner speaking for what a lot of people would have loved to have done, um, you know, in their lives. But... It's, in real life, you can't do those things, right? Well, I you tried. Jail. I'll say, well, this is it. This is what I was just going to yeah. say. So the era you that you, you talked about there, it's called the Attitude Era Rules, right? Um, and I remember being, I was about 13, 14, around that time. And a lot of the teachers, our parents, used to say we had attitude. So when we saw- Complimentary. Um, when we saw <laughs> the guys like representing attitude and <clears throat> all of that, it was like something for us to say like, not to go and be bad mm. or whatever, but it was a, it became really. I was hooked. It I was, was a hooked. way to rebel. Yeah, man. And 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 yeah. it's that fantasy of. You know, it's a funny thing. We uh, I used to say all the time like we were everything. We were the fantasy version of every athlete in professional yeah, athletics. Yeah. So so guys would score a touchdown and crotch chop yeah, yeah, yeah. the yeah. the opposition team, and then they would get fined or they would get in trouble by the league or whatever it was. They weren't allowed to do that. We were. 
Yeah. We, were, we were doing what they it, wanted yeah. to do. They wanted to go out and spit water and do all the stuff <laughs> I was doing or, you know, t tell their coach to suck it when they didn't like the play <laughs> calls or whatever, right? Like that rebellious nature, there was so much of that. Everything was so pent up and it mm -hmm. became, um, I think it just became a, a sort of a war cry yeah. in a who, way for a lot, of, a lot of people in that generation. Who would you credit? Like there's a lot of um, people that get credited for the, attitude era or was it a collective thing it's a collective yeah. i think we were all feeling it um you know it's a funny thing if you're a corporate guy if you're vince you're a little bit older you're having to appease corporate uh, usa network all these different mm -hmm. things that you have above you 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 have to appease to some of those things but he's a sort of a maverick and a rebel mm, by nature, right? Taker, that's yeah, that's yeah. his thing. The rest of us were doing this business, but we're like, sort of like, this stuff isn't working. These cartoon characters and this sort of following the rules is not working. Like, it, it doesn't work for us. It's not what we would want to see. If we were just the fans, yeah. this is not what we would want to see. So here's what we would want to see. When we first started doing DX, when, when Vince first put us together, we hadn't even necessarily called ourselves DX yet. We were, get, I mean, literally getting threatened to be fired every week when we would come back. Who, what? The, Vince. Oh, is it? <laughs> v Vince, but he was getting letters from USA. There's a very famous skit that we did where USA had been on us for weeks. That these guys cannot say that stuff. They cannot do those gestures. They have to stop it. We would go out and do it the next week, and we would come back, and Vince would tear us apart. You guys are going to get us thrown off the air. God damn it, he was pissed. But he wasn't doing anything about it, right? Like ah. where we felt like, yeah. right, it's like a so lot of threatening, a lot of threatening yeah. going on, yeah. but he's not really doing anything. And t numbers are starting to tick up a little bit, right? So there's a moment in time where we get this letter from USA Network that it literally, the, the whole letter is, DX has gone too far. This, this Degeneration X group has gone too far. They are no longer, between the eight o'clock and the nine o'clock <laughs> hour, they are no longer allowed to use these words. Boom, boom, boom. They're no longer allowed to refer to their genitals. They're no longer <laughs> referred. Like, it's written out. And then from, from uh, I don't remember the time, from 10 to 11, they're no longer allowed to say these things. But they can use these words. They can do this. They can't do that. And Vince brought us a letter. And he's like, well, here it is. And and if these things aren't met, if these demands aren't followed to a T, they will, you will no longer be on the air on USA Network. Right? They, they Either they get fired or... You're no longer on the air. And Vince is like, well, see, you guys have crossed the line now. Here it is, black and white. What are we going to do about this? And we said, let us take the letter and use it on TV. Yes. And he was like, in what way? I said, we will make that into a comedy routine. That is ridiculous. <laughs> and we did a... We did, a, did he agree to this? He agreed yeah, to and your he was idea. Like, yep. And he was like, all right, make sure it's funny. <laughs> uh, but he's got a pretty warped sense of what's funny so it was all right but uh, we did like a presidential podium and the three of us got up there as if sean was president and we were standing behind him and we went through the list of words and they beeped the words we weren't allowed to say and we said you know this direct from usa we we indeed generation x apologize for our attitudes we will no longer say the words and we went through the list and then we will no longer refer to our massive genitalia <laughs> yeah, right? we went through this whole thing and then got into arguments about it god damn you can't say that well yeah, shit yeah. i didn't know yeah, and like right we would go yeah, yeah. so we turned it into this comedy routine it was right at the point when bill clinton had just given the the i did not sleep with that yes, young so. intern mm -hmm. and that's how we ended it and sean <laughs> michael said i did not sleep with that young intern as a matter of fact i was up all night <laughs> <laughs> we did it as a skit put it on the air, did the rest of the show. Um, next day, we got a letter from USA that said, congratulations on the ratings last night. What DX did with our letter w was hilarious. Congratulations on the success. Here's to many more years. It just shows you, guys, doesn't it? It just, yeah. just shows you. It's, it just flipped. And, and we sort of were of that mentality going into those things of like, Look, if the numbers go up, what are we doing wrong? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, isn't the whole point to get more viewers? If more viewers are coming in, like, clearly we're doing something right here. That Amazing. was early. Yeah. Mm. No, I've, I've known you. I go just on. wanted I'll, to ask something for myself. That, um, so, just you, you've, you've spoken a lot about what you're doing now and and what it is to be a, a good performer. But where do you think you did your best in ring work? Is there a particular time period or a rivalry that really sticks out for you? It's hard to say. You know sort of leading into that time frame, there's a moment in time where 
the Attitude Era is in full swing, and then Austin gets injured and he goes down mm. with an injury, and sort of it becomes Rock and I, which the Rock and I is an interesting thing because I come in a little bit before he does as a talent. And I'm Hunter Hearst Helmsley. He comes in as Rocky Maivia. Yeah. We wrestle over the Intercontinental title. He becomes the Rock, goes with the nation of di nation of uh, domination. Domination. I transformed to Triple H. Like we're coming out of these characters, transformed to Triple H. DX is formed. We have rivalries of you know over that. So over the Intercontinental title, then we get into these groups, and it's sort of DX versus the Nation. He and I are battling over the Intercontinental Championship again. Then he. Uh, you know, full blown becomes The Rock, leaves the nation. I become Triple H, leave DX. We battle over the WWE Championship. Like our careers, sort of in a way, marry each other and are intertwined with each other along mm -hmm. the way. And we never sort of had that defining WrestleMania yeah, moment. True. Um, a few years ago, we teased he and I wrestling one more time, and it was on that. He came to me and was like, hey, dude, I got one more in me. I want to do it with you. I want you and I to have that WrestleMania sort of moment, Amazing. and let's do it at WrestleMania. And it turned out that uh, it was for the following year, so we had done this video for it, and we're ready to go with it. And somewhere along the time of that year, uh, his movie career sort of wow. – changed and and he was like oh man i'm not gonna be able to do this the mm -hmm. timing just doesn't work out right and i can't pass up this other opportunity no problem um but that's really where we were headed but uh, so our careers sort of up until he left for hollywood you know there was this crazy moment and then or, or crazy moments through all of it where it mirrored each other during that period of time when austin left it really sort of becomes in a lot of ways, like you still have Taker, you have McFoley, you have a lot of players, but mm -hmm. it becomes at a, at a high level about me and Rock in a oh. lot of ways. And then Austin returns. It's why we didn't, in 2000, we had a WrestleMania, it was like a fatal four-way or whatever with a, with a McMahon in each corner and all that. Yeah. It was originally supposed to be Rock and I in, a, in a, the Iron Man match, right, that we did, I think, at Backlash. Uh, mm. They postponed that to Backlash because Austin wasn't ready to return yet. And so we sort of pushed the match out a month, which he and I fought hard against, but it was like, huh, you know, it's better for business overall if this and get past WrestleMania to get to that. But, you know, that was sort of, would have been the culmination of I, you know, my rivalry with him and him with me and it, it sort of something we sort of missed out on. But God, I, I wrestled Rock like probably more than anybody. Mm -hmm. um, maybe with the exception of Austin because there was a moment in time when, when Sean got injured I was the guy wrestling Austin through all of that. And then when he would come back, I would wrestle Austin through all of that. Like, you know, if you if you look at that time frame of Rock and Austin as being the two biggest baby faces, it's like, you know, to give you like a Star Wars reference, like Han Solo and Luke Skywalker yeah. was the better good guy. I was Darth Vader. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right? And <laughs> and sort of had that role against the opposition of both those guys. It was, it was a very cool period. You know of time. what? It's important to say as well. When Austin, it was, Austin was up here and the, the organization was up there. So when he got injured, it was like, oh no. And then you guys stepped Filled in. The void. Oh man. Yeah. But then, like, but then you, you, I remember the storyline as well when Austin came back and the, the two man power trip, which, yeah. which at the time was, uh, it was like a fantasy. Yeah, man. It was like a fantasy yeah. because you guys dominated all the belts and yeah. then you had the great rivalry of. Uh, the Brothers of Destruction that actually was that was in the UK as well. It culminated, wasn't it? Yeah. Insurrection. Yes. So like, how did well, that? Come we about? were having a blast with it. Yeah. And then you know I got injured, and then it just changed the whole thing, right? And yeah. it, it it totally took on a different direction. But yeah, that was um, I don't know. You know, it's a funny thing. I don't know, Steve. Um, I don't think Steve ever really saw himself fully as like a good guy, right? He saw himself like he just he was like me. Like I never was really comfortable, even in DX when we were popular, I never was super comfortable as a babyface. I always wanted to be the heel. Mm -hmm. And sort of that was my natural role. I think he is the same, of that same mindset. So there's a moment in time where he was like, kid, what do you, th what do you think if we, uh, you and I did this thing where, where, man, we hooked up, like it'd be unstoppable, you know? And like, 
Cool. Let's yeah. go. Let's have you, go have you noticed there. in this conversation quite how starstruck <laughs> our producer is? Have you seen just that encyclopedic yeah. knowledge of yeah. it? Yeah. You even know where, cool. the, why, where, yeah. the, where the events took place. That's exceptional. Well, I remember Insurrection at the time was a big deal because it was in the UK and it was the chance to see see the guys. Mm-hmm. And I mean, yeah. you, you, you know, funny, a funny, I'll give you a funny story on that one. I, I believe it's that when uh, Taker got his ear clipped open by Steve's knee brace. Yeah. And uh, we had to fly out for whatever reason. I, I don't. I, and again, this is a little sketchy from time, but like, we, we had to get on a plane immediately following the event. Like I remember, I uh, we came in our gear and changed at the airport. We got on a charter and flew back to the U.S. And we were still in our gear, and we at the we, we got to the airport and we went in the locker room and changed. And uh, Taker's ear was like hanging. We had a plastic surgeon going to meet him in the states. And I stood for the longest time on a seat behind him, putting pressure wow. on his head and his oh, ear. Because once you get up at pressure, right, yeah, yeah, you yeah. bleed like a stuck yeah. pig. So I stood behind him for the longest time, holding pressure on his ear to try to get it to stop bleeding while we were flying home. Oh, wow. um, you're okay. It's horrific. <laughs> no, it, was, it was his hair. His ear was hanging on. Like, 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 story. We named yeah. we named some um, legends there: Mick Foley. The Rock, yourself, Undertaker, Sto- Undertaker Stone Cold. Like, if we're talking football terms, that's like the class of 92, yeah, right? Yeah, that was an era, wasn't like, it? That's it was like an, an era defining really period. Yeah. It's a funny thing, though, to us. Like, in the moment, we, you sort of kind of knew how special it was mm. because, you know, you go back a few years prior to that and, and Austin and I are standing at a curtain saying, man, you think it'll ever get like it was in the 80s when... Hogan and those guys yeah. were running and everything was sold out. And then you fast forward six months or whatever period of time that was and everything sold out and yeah. beyond. We're setting box office records everywhere we go and, and it's beyond that. In some manner, you know that. And in some manner, it's just Tuesday, yeah. you know, and you're just doing your thing. We've all had that conversation. I've, I know I've had it with Foley. I've had it with Austin. I've had it with Rock mm. where like... Man, thank you for that time. Yeah, yeah. It's, you nice, didn't, it's a nice way to look at it. Yeah, as well. you didn't realize it how special it really was, and that it wouldn't last forever. Like, you know, you always see that in movies or something like this. Will be the greatest time mm. of your life, and you don't realize it, and mm. then you flash back to that throughout your mm. whole life. Like that, that moment in time, that attitude era, where we went from, yeah, we're the guys you see on the WWE television to. You couldn't step out of your house yeah. or a hotel room without getting mobbed. Were there you any rivalries in that period? Of course. Were there any rivalries that that never came to fruition? Were oh. there any any uh, opponents that you would like to have cultivated more of a rivalry with? Yeah, I mean, I think there's periods of time like so when once once we win the war and Monday Night Wars and we sort of take over WCW and guys come in. Like I always wanted to work with Rey Mysterio, mm. you know, but I I think I've been in the ring with him like twice. Right. My he's over entire here. career. Really? No, yeah, yeah, no. he's going to be over here for Clash, yes. yeah. But, um, you know, there's certain guys like that that I, I always would watch him work. Like, oh, I'm such a fan of his work. And, like, just a, 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 I could just feel what that working with him would be like and how easy that would be and how big we could make it. We just never ended up in the same place in the same storylines, mm-hmm. you know. And I've thrown it out there a lot over the years of like, hey, what if Ray and I did something? But he was always like on SmackDown, I was on Raw, yeah. or vice versa, and it just never panned out. But he was always a guy that I always thought, like, man, I would love to have, like, you know, gone and done something big with him. You've been involved with a few eras that are like, even as we say, that uh, evolution, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, Randy Orton, um, Batista, you're there again. Yeah. And, and to go on 30 years, and this is, jay Z's my favourite rapper, not because of so much the lyrics, but the longevity. Yeah. Like being able to, okay, the, the scenes change now, but you move with it. And that's what I think personally, like, you think you know this, but that for me, that's what you've been incredible at over I, the years. I, I think sometimes of the moments in the business that I was fortunate enough to be, but fortunate and maybe sometimes unfortunate enough to be a part of, but like... um. You know, I, I sometimes, I, th- I think of the song Sympathy for the Devil. It's like the devil talking okay. about how he's been there for these generations and all these massive moments in history. He's been there for all these things. Like, I look at the curtain call, right? Changes the business. I look at the Montreal screw job. Like, I'm, I'm in the curtain yes. call. I'm instrumental in the, the Montreal screw job, positively or negatively. <laughs> um, you go to the Attitude Era, the, the, at the sort of the forefront of that. You go to the Monday Night Wars. I'm the guy driving the tank over to 
to WCW and mm -hmm. and sort of. Not the Forrest Gump of professional wrestling. In, 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 yeah. that, that's yeah, way true, less cool. Yeah. That's yeah. way less cool yeah, than yeah, what yeah. I said. Sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's what you said. Sorry, I'll, I'm just yeah. going to stand behind Call Sympathy me. for the <laughs> devil or Forrest Gump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is like a box of chocolates, yeah. but I feel <laughs> way less cool now. Um, but yeah, having those moments, you know, Degeneration X, evolution, you know, following that down the line. Um, even the McMahon Helmsley era, right? Mm. The, then, then getting into the the sort of corporate stuff of, yeah. of that's a good era yeah, <laughs> yeah. the 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 authority mm. it's just being being so lucky and so fortunate to be a part of all those things but also to have such incredible people to work with mm. and to be a part of those you know those moments with them you know even even to when you come to wrestlemania and like the the uh, Taker and I working in the end of an era match with Sean in there and mm. having that moment where we're all standing yeah. and in, in some way symbolically, at least for us, closing out an era that, you know, sort of took the business to a whole nother level and sort of he, here's the three last Dying breed, like yeah. focal players of that time frame closing it out all standing together mm -hmm. on that stage like it's it's, it's hard it's to symbolic isn't it yeah it really is you know yeah. and, and and even then like you talk about evolution like a moment in time of me saying like God, we need to build some new stars here and i say well you know i go to vince and say well if you let me take flair he's like the elder statesman for us yeah. i take it as my position and we give the rub to new to a couple of new guys yeah. and we form this group and let us take that and and build two new mega stars out of this and he was like, "All right, well, you pick. You tell us who you want to do it with, and I'll tell you who I want you to do it with, and and we'll kind of get back together on it." And Rick and I went and looked at everybody, and we were like, "Randy Orton, Dave Batista." They made a different suggestion on one hand, which we then uh, cast aside. But we, Randy Orton and Dave Batista, and then we put them with us. And the whole goal of that group was to get them both to be megastars eventually get to a place where they go through me and Rick and they become the next level people. And, you know. Kind of worked. Yeah. <laughs> well, except for you. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, that, that's part of the storyline, yeah. right? But then, th then then you make them earn it. But, you know, you look at the the fabric of, of that generation after that, there's like, Dave becomes, Dave Batista See, becomes no. one of the biggest stars yeah. of that generation, goes on to make multiple talents, goes on to become Guardians of the Galaxies and a massive movie star. Randy Orton becomes one of the best of all time yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. and, and doing what he's doing. And they had the tools. They just, you know, for me, it was about giving them the opportunity that I didn't know if they were going to get or not. Like mm -hmm. Dave, right prior to that, was like the Deacon Batista. He was like, mm -hmm. certainly wasn't lighting the yeah. world on fire, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, th those, those are just cool. They're all cool moments go to see Africa, them all yeah. go down, you know. Can I ask you, what you feel with the influencer, the social media star, YouTuber, getting involved with likes of boxing, wrestling, we've got Logan Paul, who you guys have signed up, right? Yeah. How do you feel about that? I think it's great. Yeah. If you said to me, hey, there's this guy, Logan Paul, he wants to get involved in the wrestling business, wants to get involved in WWE, he wants to become a WWE superstar. And he comes in and he's got an attitude and he doesn't want to get hurt and he doesn't want to take bumps and he doesn't want to do what everybody else is doing and he wants it to be special and all about him. I go like, yeah, no, I'm not doing that, right? When somebody comes in that loves it, yeah. that is passionate about it, that trains their ass off for it, you don't do what he did yeah, he's mad. Uh, in, 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 the, in the events that he's worked for us. You don't do what he's done at WrestleMania without a lot of hard work and a lot of effort. Same thing with Bad Bunny. This guy's the mm. big, he, he just wins Artist of the Year, the Video Music Awards, right? He is the, in arguably the biggest musical attraction on Crazy. the planet. Yeah. And he is like, hey, when can I get in the ring for you guys again? Yeah, and when I tell you that he was, like when he was gonna do the stuff for us um, with Miz and, and all of that uh, at WrestleMania and, and uh, have that moment, we, very honest with him. Like, you're going to have to work really hard at this. Went and got a house, Orlando, Florida, just down the road. Showed up every day at that performance center. Wow. Got in that ring every single day, getting his ass kicked. It's a story that people don't acknowledge, isn't it? People often would look at somebody like Logan Paul and think, oh, I want that life. But what they don't hear is that he grafts. grafts. He works as hard as you possibly can. As hard as you can. When, yeah. when I tell you, dude, that guy got, like... He's not the biggest guy on the planet, right? But he got beat up 
bad really? every single day. And he would show up every single day. I go to the Performance Center a lot. It was my gig, especially at the time. Every time I'd be there, they'd be like, Bunny's in the other room training. If you want to go say hi. Like, All right, I'd go in there. He'd be killing himself, sweat pouring off him, beat up, you know. Do you, is there a, he don't need to do that. Yeah. Is there a case where you say, give it to him a little bit extra, let's put him through it? <laughs> no, but you're not going to. So th th there's a fine line between what we do being very real and being safe. And mm -hmm. right, You can't halfway do it. Mm -hmm. You either do it or you don't. Up. Right? You get slammed on the mat, it it hurts. Your yeah. guy jumps off top rope, lands on you, it hurts. There's no, there's no other way around it. And you have to learn how to do it because you have to protect yourself and you have to protect your opponent from serious injury, right? So you have to learn how to do it. He put in the effort. If they're willing to put in the effort and 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 do that, then to me they're no different than me. Absolutely. They have a passion for doing this. Let's 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 go with that passion for doing this. Like Logan Paul, let's go with that passion mm -hmm. for doing it. Let's run with it. And if he can make get more eyeballs on us, if he can make himself an attraction, if he can draw people in to watch and they're excited about it, it's great for everybody, Amazing. you know, and, and, and that's the thing. Uh, it doesn't have to be everybody's first love. And Rock wanted to play in the NFL. Yeah, didn't work out for him. Yeah, yeah. He ended up doing okay for himself, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. But it wasn't his first thing that he wanted to do. But it, but once he got into doing it, it was his family in his family, and he loved it. But when he started to do it, he fell in love with it even more, mm. and it became everything to him. Um, you know, he and I talk about that a lot. He go make all the movies in the world. There's no point in time when he's making a movie where he stands in front of a hundred thousand people with goosebumps all over his body yeah. because the energy is just so unbelievable, Rocky. right? Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 You don't get that making a movie. No, absolutely. And there's nothing like it. Triple H, it has been an honor to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us stop, on Sport Bible Stories. Yeah. Just one thing before you go. Because it's hot. It's like 95 It's degrees. really warm in here. Yeah. It's really, really warm. Yeah, just one it's thing. hot, so we got to stop before I melt. I have to ask you, this isn't on our running order. Can I just have a look at your watch? That is incredible. Yeah. That is the nicest watch I've ever seen in my entire life. If you are listening to this and you aren't on video, this is just... One of the most beautiful pieces I've ever seen. Lovely suit as well, by the way. Thank I'm you. just in awe of you. Yeah. I'm in yeah. true awe. You should see my underwear. This, this is, is This incredible. is the content you don't, don't get Top. to see on SmackDown. This is it? unbelievable. Top shelf underwear. <laughs> Thank you so much. That is, that is beautiful. Thank you very much. Real honor to work with you. Thank you so Thank much. Very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Really? Oh. People go, oh, you're hard done by now. We didn't win enough games, right? Mm. Fact: The eight games that remaining were arguably the best run of games yeah. on paper. So that was the only bit I couldn't get. I was like, "Well, that's the best run, and you're taking us out two days before the best run." Well, if you got a lap dance, you'd have to spin again, so it's mm. your fine to get the number of someone you do the lap dance. Oh, oh, wow. Wow. Genius! 